Grace, mercy, and peace are ours in Christ, in his name. Amen. The word of God from which we meditate upon today comes from our epistle lesson read just a few moments ago. But here again, especially these words. St. Paul writes, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Here ends our text in the name of Jesus, dear friends. October is a special month to begin with. After all, in October, fall is now in full swing. The leaves are beginning to change. We get these beautiful fall days. Families are picking apples. You're making apple cider. You're painting. You're carving, uh, carving pumpkins. And you get these delicious meals a nice bowl of chili. Uh, but you all know, because we've been talking about it all year, why October is especially important. Because here in October, we're celebrating our Lutheran heritage, culminating in the celebration of the Reformation. Each week as you come to church, you'll get to hear another aspect of our Lutheran heritage. Last week, Pastor Allersmeyer shared with you one of the things, and that would be mission work. Lutherans care about missions. We take seriously Christ's command to share his name to the very ends of the earth. This morning, then, we get to hear another part of our Lutheran heritage, and that is the riches in Christ. This is really fundamental for what it means to be Lutheran. The riches of Christ. Namely, the gospel. It shapes and it forms who we are. And we get to reevaluate our past and our present and our future. There is a young man named Sean who is finishing up his last semester of college. He was pretty busy. He was writing papers, studying for finals. But he was also busy because he was getting ready for potential job offers. As he was thinking about these job offers, he started to consider, well, what kind of questions might they ask me in an interview? What should I wear to an interview? And how might this future employer see me? Sean decided that perhaps he needed a change in his social media presence. He got onto Facebook, and he started to look through his profile. Uh, all the things that he had liked, all the things he had commented on, all those things he had shared, and those pictures that he uploaded that anybody could see. And he started to wonder, how might an employer see me through the lens of Facebook? For Sean, a change in his life situation resulted in a reconsideration, a re-evaluation of his past, for the sake of his present and his future. In our text for this morning, St. Paul undergoes a similar re-evaluation. St. Paul is confronted with the gospel, the riches of Christ, and it forces Paul to reconsider his entire life. You'll remember with me when this took place. It didn't happen in Philippians chapter 3, but it actually happened already in Acts chapter 9, where Paul was formerly known as Saul. And Saul was a bad guy. He was persecuting Christ's church. He was rounding up Christians and bringing them off to be set on trial. And as Saul was on his way to Damascus, the Lord Jesus confronts him. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then the Lord Jesus, he sends his pastor. He sends Ananias to go. And Ananias arrives, and he preaches to Saul the gospel, and he baptizes him. Upon receiving these riches of Christ, Saul, now named Paul, has his entire life changed. Upon receiving the gospel, and the whole gospel, the death and the resurrection, Christ reigning now and Christ's promise to return, it changes Paul's entire life. It causes him to reevaluate how he might consider his past and his present and his future. 
And so St. Paul begins our text by boldly proclaiming who he was before he received the riches of Christ. St. Paul was both good and bad. The good of Paul, he was born into the family of God, circumcised on the eighth day. He was a student of the scriptures. He tried his best to follow God's law perfectly. But the bad of Paul, he got the scriptures wrong. He misinterpreted them. He persecuted Christ's church and he killed Christians. But upon receiving the riches of Christ, St. Paul reevaluates his past. All the things that he had done, both good and bad, Paul counts as worthless. All of those things, they don't count towards anything, he says. St. Paul now sees through this large lens of the gospel, and that because of Christ's death and his resurrection, Paul lives confidently, not in his own righteousness, but in the righteousness found in Christ alone. As I look out in this church this morning, I see people like St. Paul, like myself, who are both good and bad. People who at times are faithful followers of Christ, and those same people who at other times are poor, miserable sinners. But the riches of Christ have come to you also, and they force you to reevaluate your life as well. Not to see yourself based on the things that you've done or the things that you haven't done. Not to see yourself on all these good things you've done or to see yourself as a giant pain in the butt. What matters is Christ. His riches, they cover over you. And it's no longer about you, but now it's about Jesus. These riches of Christ, will they continue to be lavished upon you, uh, not only affecting our past, but, but affecting our very present. For St. Paul, the death and the resurrection of Christ, well, they affect how we live right now. As we live, we get to suffer with Christ, knowing that because he lives well, we have life in his name as well. The Apostle Paul certainly suffered for Christ's name. The scriptures tell us that he was beaten, he was stoned, he was placed in prison, and most likely executed for his faith in Jesus. Today, God's people continue to suffer with Christ as well, and yet we do it in different ways. Today, you're not going to be stoned or placed in prison for believing in Jesus, but you also get to suffer for his name. It's going to happen in all kinds of different situations. Perhaps you're going to get to suffer with Christ as you don't get to go to the soccer game on Sunday morning because you're going to be here in God's house to receive his riches. Perhaps you're going to suffer with Christ as you're not invited to go out to the girls' night because they're going to talk about things that, well, the Lord doesn't think you should talk about. And they don't really want you there telling them what they should or shouldn't be talking about. Perhaps you're going to suffer with Christ as you stand out. You don't conform with everybody else, but you're different. You're weird. They're going to mock you. They're going to think little of you. They're not going to understand why you do the things that you do. But again, the riches of Christ, they cause us to reevaluate our present, rejoicing that in the midst of our present sufferings now, that we are connected to Christ. And as he lives, we get to live forever as well. The riches of Christ, they continue to be lavished upon us even more. Uh, not just our, present, or our past and our present that are changed, but, but even our very future and our hope. Because of Christ, we know that the things that we see in this world, uh, they're not going to be like this forever. We've seen some pretty bad things this last month as a nation. We've seen natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires throughout our country. We've seen political unrest, North Korea, uh, the Black Lives Matters movement, football players kneeling during the national anthem. 
And just recently, we have seen a senseless act of evil as a man opens fire in the midst of a crowd, killing over 50 people and harming many more. There's evil all around us. It's all out there, but, but it's also right next to us, too. Bills, they pile up. And many of our families are wondering, how are we going to make it through this month? The evil affects us as vows that we be with you forever are broken. And families are devastated by divorce. The evil affects us personally as the doctor says, cancer. And as our loved ones are called home to life and salvation. But again, the riches of Christ force us to reevaluate what we see. What we see is certainly a fallen and broken world, but what we also see are the promises of Christ. That he promises that he will return. And when he comes, he's going to fix this broken world. He's going to purge it from all of its evil and from all of its sin. And that when he does that, there will be no more unpaid bills, no broken families, no killing, no death, no natural disasters, no more political unrest. But these promises of Christ tell us that all things will be made new, that we won't live in this broken world forever, but Christ will come and will live with him in the new creation. The riches of Christ, what God has done through his son Jesus, through his death, his resurrection, his present rule, and even his promise to return, it changes our entire lives. It changes who we are. These riches were given to you, first and foremost at your baptism. There you became a child of God and an heir to eternal life. These riches of Christ continue to be lavished upon you as you come each and every week to his house, as you hear his word proclaimed for you, for your life. These riches of Christ continue to be given as you come before the Lord's altar and his body and blood is placed into your mouth for your forgiveness. These riches of Christ, they mean our entire life is changed. It no longer has to be about me and my pile of sins, but now it all gets to be about Christ and what he has done for me. The riches of Christ mean that as I suffer in this life, I get to have my eyes focused on Jesus and the life that he's won for me. The riches of Christ mean that as I see evil all around me, I know that this is not how it's always going to be. But Christ will return, and he will make all things new. The riches of Christ are part of our Lutheran heritage. And I'd suggest to you they're not just a part of it. They're at the very core of who we are. It's the gospel that changes and defines who you are. You are Christ's, both now and forevermore. Amen. We rise.